Well, thank all of you for being here, and uh, I hope to add to the wonderful uh, large amount of information that's being presented here. Uh, I've taken a little different approach to it. Before I begin, <clears throat> I want to recognize Dr. Yasinka Rakas. Is she here? There she is in the back by the door. She's the one who's made this possible by inviting Sustainable Aviation Foundation's symposium to come to the UC Berkeley, so let's give her a hand. <laughs> now, uh, like all presenters, I want to begin with a little description of where I come from, and this little collage uh, shows my 1973, when I was in medical school, I built this electric car, uh, hand-built from scratch, and it would go 70 miles an hour. Uh, it was freeway legal. I drove it to the hospital as an intern. I went on uh, from there and helped build a 1978. Uh, very easy. Up here, we put a custom exhaust system on it. And then in 1981, I founded the Cafe... Uh, races, of, a mile per gallon races for aircraft, and the first year Bert Rutan was one of the winners there with me. Um, then in 82 it became the Cafe 400 race, which was a 400 mile race for general aviation, mile per gallon times velocity was the, the metric. And then this was my day job for the last 42 years. Uh, in 2000, well in, in 1990 I I bought an old Mooney and did a fanatical drag reduction program and gained 37 miles an hour cruise speed um, without a change in horsepower. And then um, here in 2010, actually 2009, I, I went to Ames and then in 2010 I went to NASA Langley to talk about this concept of, back then I was calling it sky transit or urban mobility we call it today, and the concept was to talk about pocket air parks. Uh, so it was an orientation that was a fixed wing orientation. Um, I'm going to divert a moment here to tell a story about my days as an undergrad here at Berkeley as a biological science student. One of my favorite memories was zoology class, and what happened there one day was the professor said he was going to prove that Reptiles are not cold-blooded. So he had in his lab a 30-foot by 3-foot box full of topsoil, and under it was a heating grid with frozen soil at one end and blistering hot soil at the other. And he dumped a whole bucket of lizards into this and sprinkled them along the soil and turned out the lights and left the lab, and an hour later he came back, and all the lizards were piled on top of each other at the 72-degree stripe. This ties to what's happened to us as people. We, we cluster in urban clusters, and we're doing so more and more as time goes on, and that's why urban air mobility is so important. Uh, this is another little diversion from my main talk. Cars are bad. Um, Alison Arieff, who writes for the New York Times and who was going to be one of our presenters here, just wrote this new piece about the fatalities uh, to pedestrians by cars. Now, fortunately, we don't expect pedestrian fatalities with urban air mobility, but another fellow, Matthew Lewis, on Twitter gave the listing of things as to why cars are bad. They're poisoning the ocean, they're wrecking the climate, they're the leading cause of death for young humans. They take up most public space in our cities and drive up the cost of housing. They're the leading cause of hazardous air quality in most cities, and we subsidize them at levels approaching trillions. Their fuel is a primary cause of global conflict, and it is even legal for drivers to kill pedestrians and cyclists if they stay with the corpse and tell police they couldn't see them. Now, the green block there is... 195 million square feet of pavement. That's how much pavement there is in San Francisco. And yet, so far, there are no pavement areas for sky taxis. On the upper right, you see the comparison of how much uh, surface area it takes to put 50 people in cars or 50 people on a bus and so forth. 
So the other reason cars are bad is in my ophthalmology practice, every day I see people with burning, irritated eyes, and I finally realized that these are people who are making long commutes. They're driving 50 miles on the freeway through a tunnel of soot. And <clears throat> this is yet another reason why one theme coming out of this conference in the future may be, how could any of us, all of us perhaps, live without a car? Another factor that uh, I want to make sure everyone understands is the National Household Transportation Survey of 2009 shows these numbers for the number, number of people in a car, typically. And as you can see, the average is about 1.67 most recently. And <clears throat> this weighs upon how many seats you need to put in your sky taxi. Okay, now to the main topic of the talk, selection pressure. The factors that contribute to the selection of variations that provide an individual or group with an increased chance of surviving over others. Survival includes all threats, whether competitive, natural, or from predators. Edward O. Wilson put it succinctly as, mutation proposes, the environment disposes. So what are the selection pressures for urban air mobility aircraft? And how will it affect the more than 200 new startups that are trying to succeed in this market? What will act as the predators or threats to their success? I'm going to enumerate what I think are the selection pressures, and they come in three categories. The first are those for human need. You can see here safety and trust and autonomy, biophilia or the user experience, G's and jerk, ride quality, privacy boundaries and man-spreading, bladder capacity, infirm and disabled people as passengers, and finally noise. But the economic pressures have to do with what's called GTT, the ground travel time, how quickly can you get to the air park. The turnaround time, or TAT, how quickly can a plane come and go with a load. The cruise airspeed of the vehicle, how critical is it. The lift to drag ratio, and then what I call the rule of 42, which is a pricing rule, and finally the aircraft cost. And then the predators in this space, who will they be? Huge corporations with buyouts or, or international competition, FAA certification as a hurdle impediment, a visionary presidential, presidential candidate who wants to make UAM a uh, platform, or perhaps a future NASA Apollo-like project. So human needs, uh, we have to have UAM that will carry everybody of all sizes, ages, and capabilities. And <clears throat> we already have autonomy that we th I think should be trusted, but we have to convince everyone that it should be trusted. You see here the X-47B that can make pinpoint landings on a pitching carrier deck at 245 feet per second touchdown speeds. It can autonomously refuel, as you see in the upper right. Uh, the vehicles that we have in your urban air mobility, they're going to have to be agile in the air because you won't have that much room to turn and avoid. Uh, a little sidelight here <clears throat> about the non-biting midges that are this small and they swarm, and there's something about this that teaches us about autonomous flight. E.O. Wilson in Genesis, The Deep Origin of Society says, winged adults of these midges of one of the species gather in hundreds or thousands in aerial swarms in order to mate. They dance about like acrobats in tight, roughly spherical groups, measuring from under a meter to tens of meters, their swarms seem to hang in the air. And if you pass your hand through one, don't worry, they don't bite, the group disintegrates into swirling fragments. And when you pull your hand back, the group reunites. So in that tiny midge's brain, how many lines of code are there for this aerial sense and avoid capability? It makes <clears throat> the 100-pound uh, sense and avoid suite in the X-47 look a little too big. Now, this is the other topic that I think is 
sort of not yet touched on, and yet we should be preaching this to all the UAM companies that are trying to build vehicles. The user experience. Um, and again, E.O. Wilson, one of my heroes, he describes this biophilia as the innate tendency to focus on life and life-life processes. Clear-cutting the Amazon rainforest to put in crops is like burning a Renaissance painting to cook dinner. And regarding competition among UAM companies, for birds on an island, the probability that any given species will go extinct increases as more species crowd into the island. This gives two comparable views of what is called the theory of prospect and refuge. Again, user experience. Our survival instincts are we'd like to hide out in a cave and see what's going on out in the forest. We want a safe place. We also love green. It's, it's why we have green uh, golf courses and baseball and football fields. And if you were a child, you used to think, let's build a fort or a tree house. It's again this impulse toward biophilia. So when you design your sky taxi, design it with an outward view. G's and jerk forces. Uh, this is a, a famous photo of the kind of thing that happens on a rocket sled. We can't do anything like this with our sky taxis. There are a known and acceptable limits of the rate of change of acceleration, which is called the jerk rate. And amusement parks have set the limit at approximately three meters per meter, uh, three meters per second cubed. So here's a graph that I made to show how you could accelerate up to 67 miles an hour in just five seconds at 0.8 g's, but the dotted black line is the line of the jerk. And what you see there is that the jerk rises fairly abruptly and gets up just above three and maintains that until the uh, g's of acceleration goes level and then the jerk rate quickly comes back to baseline. And then the heavy line is the velocity of the vehicle which comes up here to 30 meters per second or about 67 miles per hour. It used to be difficult for some to climb up on the wing of a, of a Mooney or a Beechcraft and get into the aircraft. The boarding time at our heliports or, or uh, vertiports or air parks is a critical matter and I'm going to show why in a minute. The ride quality. This has always been a serious issue for fixed-wing aircraft, even relatively slow ones. And yet, here's some more technology where the actual seat in the vehicle can become a noise-canceling seat, a bump-canceling seat. And in addition to that, the airframe itself can be morphed and changed or have anticipatory trim tabs that make the ride quality acceptable, even on gusty days. Privacy boundaries. We know that there is an imaginary space around each one of us, and we don't want it intruded on. And as many of you know, economy class on the airlines now doesn't give you much choice about this. It's shown by this study on the upper left that MRI scans show a lighting up of the emotional center amygdala in the brain of those who are crowded and we have to respect this in the design of the sky taxi. In addition, we have to accommodate people large and small, and yet we have to respect the need to minimize frontal area, to minimize drag in these limited power airplanes. The bladder capacity is a factor, and it determines the range that an aircraft that has no toilet can really be expected to take people in everyday service. So this graph is a picture of the kinds of range that you could get as our batteries get better. The red line is where we are now, and I'm going to talk in a minute about what that means. But if we look at uh, something like the aqua-colored line, that's 500 watt-hours per kilogram. And you can see there that a lift-to-drag ratio of something like 18 would enable you to fly from SFO to LAX on a single battery charge. 
<coughs> we have to accommodate the infirm and disabled, and we have to think in terms of a sky taxi that not only can carry them, but could carry a medivac litter, or perhaps could carry cargo. And so the ADA disability requirements need to be thought of not just in the vehicle design, but also in the air park design. And finally, noise. <clears throat> and yet noise is the biggest factor, and I'm going to dwell on it a little bit. For those of you who've never gone to a city council meeting and seen this kind of eruption against your local airport due to noise, I can tell you it only takes 10% of the population to turn out in force and convince the city council to close your airport. This is a complex graph that shows a study of the propeller noise if you tried to take it to the extreme by having large, slow-turning propellers that still made enough thrust and yet were aiming for ultimate quiet. And so, the, on the left, the uh, dotted line that is thick blue shows that down around 500 RPM, a pair of 10-foot propellers could get down as low as 35 decibels at a 125-foot sideline. Now, whenever you speak decibels, you must define where the observer is standing. So, if we talk about the fence around the outside of a vertiport or, a, or an air park, we have to know how far is that fence from the vehicle taking off. This shows a very reputable study of multiple European airports for noise tolerance, and the big red arrow is the 10% highly annoyed population. Now, those people are highly annoyed by a decibel level that comes in at about 48 dB. And <clears throat> that's equivalent to a day-night level, or LDN, of 54.7. So the point is that we're going to need sky taxis that at the air park boundary are emitting no more than about 48 dB. And if you hear people talk about how they're going to be quieter than helicopters or they're going to be 15 dB better than, than some industry, uh, no. We have to talk about what do the neighbors at the air park hear. And that's an outdoor measurement. You can use sound walls and indoor double-pane windows and things, but remember, these people all barbecue in the backyard and the outdoor number counts. This is another <clears throat> propeller diameter study where when you get up around four meters in diameter for the prop, the decibel noise level for the constant thrust at low RPM, the decibel, the green line, goes way low uh, thanks to the low tip speeds. Likewise, the kilowatts necessary for equivalent thrust goes way down. And this is an interesting graph that looked at what would happen if we wanted to have 60 decibels at an air park boundary and we raised up the noise. What you see here is that the diameter, the red line, is the diameter needed for the air park and it jumps and gets way up into three and four and 5,000 feet diameter when the decibel level gets up to 75 and 80 and so forth. The point of it is the size of the helipad or the vertiport or the air park is going to ultimately depend upon its noise emissions. And so with the best of intentions, you may put a high proximity vertiport someplace and then you find that the only way the city council will allow you to operate it is if you expand its radius tenfold. Speaking of that, here's a graph that shows how the acreage cost of air parks goes up and up and up as the decibel level of the vehicle goes up. And in green there, you see a tiny little sliver down here of how we could build nationally 5,000 new air parks as long as the noise levels were down at that 48 dBA at the 40 meter, 132 foot sideline. But as soon as you allow it to go to 60 dB or even 66 dB, the 60 D, 66 dB means that our new air park network is going to cost almost as much as all the roads in America. So we can't do that. Um, 
And I might go back a slide here. Uh, can you go back one? Um, the gold note up there points to high-speed rail. Uh, 5,000 urban air mobility destinations at a cost like this compared to a few destinations, just 15 destinations in California for a bullet train that costs nearly a hundred billion. Why don't we spend wisely? This is a, uh, again, uh, <clears throat> a uh, survey of trip length compared to number of trips. And again, it's emphasizing noise. <clears throat> and as you get quieter, you are able to have high proximity air parks very close to where people live, and that way the ground travel time is so short that it makes sense to use the Sky Taxi on a very short trip. So you can see, here's General Aviation presently servicing 100-mile trips. If we had loud Sky Taxis, we could get some of these trips down to 40 miles, but if we go another 12 dB quieter, we can get 56 billion potential trips nationwide. Now, you won't get all of those. You, you'll get 5 or 10% of them. But now, the concept of ground travel time is closely tied to noise. So let's imagine a ground travel time of 6 minutes to get to the air park, and then another 6 minutes to go from the air park to Grandma's house. At 25 miles an hour, you can cover 2.5 miles in 6 minutes. And so here are the five mile radius, or the two and a half mile radius and five mile circles. And these four air parks completely carpet the whole area of Sonoma County where I live, where there are eight high schools. And it's an interesting ratio that you need about half as many air parks as you have high schools. And I actually use that metric to calculate the profitability. <clears throat> This is a, a, a graph that has the green lines on the left showing that to save 30 minutes on the trip, it does not much matter whether you go fast or slow. What matters is the ground travel time. And so at the high ground travel times, which are the ones in red, you can see that the trip distance, the trip distance goes way up as the ground travel time goes up, up, up. And so, again, the speed of the plane doesn't seem to matter nearly as much as the ground travel time. This is a graph showing the effect of ground travel time on the trip distance on which the Sky Taxi will save you 30 minutes. So the, the concept is the 30-minute rule. I'm not going to bother to take a Sky Taxi unless it'll save me 30 minutes each way. That's the floor. And that, to me, sets the bar for what is the minimum distance trip that still makes sense to do on a Sky Taxi. Here's another one that looks at it instead of, uh, uh, well, it just takes ground travel time and translates uh, it, translates it into the distance from the air park. So when the distance to the air park is two and a half miles, you're going to get many more billions of trips than if you have to go 12 or 22 miles to the air park. Now, profits. When I speak about profits, I was forced into doing the profitability studies. It's not because I'm an entrepreneur intending to make these profits, but I gained a sense from this exercise that really informs how we're going to have to design the Sky Taxi. And I built this spreadsheet from hell that integrates together a matrix of some 20 different parameters. And I'm going to tell you, uh, these are the emerging selection pressures for profitability. Noise, of course, ground travel time, turnaround time, the cruise speed of the plane, and it's L over D. The fare pricing, and again, I have here the rule of 42, the unit cost of the airplane and then the trip distance, and the trip distance is affected by the other factors. The rule of 42 is an, a sum of the bridge toll, the parking, the fuel, adding up to $42 when I want to go from Santa Rosa to San Francisco, one way. Well, actually that would be the round trip cost, $42. So I arbitrarily said we better keep the Sky Taxi fare at about $20 
per flight. And that is the base that's used in most of these profitability calculations. And that's way less than the fare that many other entities have been talking about for sky taxis. The baseline conditions, you can all read this, uh, it, it's quite a, a, a number of things, but the principal ones are, uh, this is based on 10% ridership in a two-seat airplane with an L over D of 12. The airplane costs $200,000. It has robotic battery swap. It's a $20 fare. 30% of the, of the flights are deadhead with no passengers. It's a 50 kilometer or 34.176 car miles trip distance average, 120 miles an hour cruise speed for the vehicle, an 800 kilogram vehicle. Uh, car trips are penalized 10% for distance. It's only 1.9 people for flight, per flight and the solo riders pay a 1.8 times fare. Um, it's a ground travel time of six minutes, 16 flyable hours. The overhead in the calculation scales to fleet size and fleet size scales to ground travel, turnaround, and cruise speed. And the number of air parks is simply 50% or half the number of high schools. And it's two and a half miles to the air park, a rate of climb sea level of 1,400 feet per minute. And here's the good news. All the air parks and nav aids are built by the U.S. government. <laughs> So you don't have to fund those. Now, here's a graph where we looked at ground travel times of 12 minutes, that is six minutes there, six minutes to grandma's house. That's the green line. And then on the left, the steep lines are with a ground travel time of, a total ground travel time of 65 minutes. That's for a 12 mile hike to the airport or a total gro uh, ground travel time of 120 minutes, two hours, if you had to go a full 22 miles to the airport. That's because the ground trip average speed during commute hours with uncertainty time is 22 miles per hour for cars. And what jumps out at you in this is simply that to get a $1 billion profit, and the billion dollar profit in each graph is that pretty green line at $1 billion of profit in just one year in just the San Francisco Bay Area. And this black line is always at zero. So that's the break-even point with no subsidy. So you can see the importance here of ground travel time and the very steep effect it has on profitability. If we look again at a fare price of $20, which equates to about 59 cents per car mile, which, by the way, is about what the IRS deduction is for car travel, we can see that the cost of the aircraft plays a big role. And if we can have a $200,000 sky taxi, thanks to mass production, then we can retain this pretty green $1 billion profit right here with the $200,000 sky taxi. This graph, another eye-opener, shows that the turnaround time which is how long it takes the plane to come in, land, taxi, unload, get people, and depart. That total turnaround time in the base study is two minutes. But what's striking is, if you take that two minutes, which is w way down here, and you jack it up to something like 10 minutes, all of your profit goes away. The $1 billion profit with the quick turnaround plummets down to barely breaking even with a $20 fare. So what really jumps out at you is that <clears throat> the turnaround time is a crucial factor. Now this one looks at the cruise speed of the airplane and when the distance to the air park is 12 or 22 miles, the speed of the plane does not matter much in profitability. But when the air parks are close in, that's when the speed of the airplane really counts on the graph, the green graph to the right. Now, aircraft design. I want to talk about flight efficiency, interference drag. In many of the vertical takeoff vehicles, there's a thing called interference drag that is much more than the number of interference drag points on, a, say, a sailplane or a glider, a fixed-wing airplane. So these examples for uh, <clears throat> uh, illustration, 
in indicate there are a lot of junctures, a lot of points at which separated flow could occur. And here we are with an airplane that needs to be efficient with high L over D, and yet we necessarily have all these intersections. Back in 1995, we convinced the FAA to authorize us to do a study of what we call the propolis Cessna 152. And I installed this glider tow hook release on the nose of the crankshaft of our Cessna 152, and I ran a cable to the cockpit so that you could pull it and disengage the rope and become a pure glider in the Cessna to measure its true drag polar. And we became fanatical about measuring drag polars it turned out 130 pounds at the VY of, of 76 miles an hour. But this fascination with drag continued on. We studied the bar-tailed Godwit and calculated that it gets 73,000 <laughs> miles per gallon on a 12,000 mile flight at 35 miles an hour. And we saw that a, a genius had come up with an extremely clean, efficient plane that could le do level flight on only 755 watts. Wonderful achievement. So in 2011, I wrote and chaired the NASA Green Flight Challenge sponsored by Google. The winning plane, a pure battery electric vehicle, flew 403, uh, achieved 403.5 passenger miles per gallon on a 200 mile flight while averaging 107 miles an hour. Drawing experience from the high aspect ratio and long range of birds. And yet, let's recognize that these are not the kinds of airplanes that are emerging as sky taxis. Why not? These airplanes can fly on very little power. Here's an example of the effect of L over D on the electricity cost to move your fleet of sky taxis. And what's notable there, according to the uh, red line, is that our nominal L over, cruise L over D of 12 is able, when the sky taxi cost is $200,000, we're able to be about here and have 8% of the total overhead be due to buying electricity. That's really not bad. Cargo. Sky taxis are going to have to offer space for luggage and cargo. And <clears throat> one of the things that you all encounter when you ride an airliner is you board and it takes time for everyone to get in the overhead bin and put their stuff away or find their things. That's all part of turnaround time. Even the time you take to stop and put on lipstick or check your phone or whatever. The study, the profitability matrix that I ran said that every second of turnaround time, on average, year-long computation, every second will cost you $1.9 million in profit. So when we design a vertiport or any kind of system, and when we design the vehicles that are going to operate there, we have to think about turnaround time. I think we've come away then with these as the selection pressures that count. Ultra quiet, two seats with a comfortable ADA cabin with a nice view, trusted near flawless autonomy, rapid low cost certification, ubiquitous access thanks to short ground travel times, a very quick turnaround time, high L over Ds, constrained Gs and jerk rates, good ride quality, low fares, the rule of 42, mass production to lower the cost of the aircraft, and hopefully government support for a vast network of air parks. And this is the most urgent selection pressure of all. Gridlock, climate change, and untenable infrastructure cost. And these are shown here in the graph, and you can all recognize that just our road cost is 300 billion a year, the climate change is costing us more than $150 billion per year. Gridlock is costing us $124 billion per year. Just Superstorm Sandy cost us $65 billion in damage. NASA's budget, $18 billion. The California high-speed rail, $98 billion. Don't you think we ought to be able to afford urban air mobility? 
That's my last slide. <clears throat> I'm afraid I ran over a bit, um, but, but I'll take one question. <laughs> Okay, that was that $1 billion profit for one air park or one airplane? What was that based on? Uh, that one is based on, I believe it's 246 air parks, ah, which is okay. approximately half the number of high schools in the nine Bay areas. Have you thought about giving your talk here as either a TED talk or on a YouTube? Uh, I, I would be happy to, but uh, no, I have, haven't thought of it. Anyway, thank you very much.